Hello and welcome to the ninth episode of My Cyber Why. This is a, a, a bit of a, a watershed episode because we have a very special guest today. The word legend gets thrown around pretty frequently, but if you're in cybersecurity, you probably aspire to or know someone who aspires to be a chief information security officer. And Steve Katz is truly a legend in our industry because he is the reason that that role even exists. The very first Chief Security Information Security Officer, Steve Katz. Welcome to My Cyber Why. And thank you so much, Diana. I guess we go back a while, and it's been a it's a wonderful career. Awesome. Yeah. Years. <laughs> so let's get started. As you know, we have four questions, and the whole purpose of My Cyber Why is to share the stories of the people that are working on the defender side and take away some of the scary from the headlines by explaining what people do and why we do it. But let's get started with who you are as a person. Who's Steve Katz? Uh, been around the business for an also long time, but I uh, married 47 years. We raised five kids. Uh, we have 13 grandkids uh, wow. running every profession in the world. We have a physician. We have uh, a uh, guy finished in third, in third year of law school. We have someone else in engineering school, another couple of kids applying to medical school. Uh, and down to a couple of kids in uh, middle school and high school doing marching band, which I never realized was as much of a cult as it is. So you, you go there and ring cowbells and cheer, and it's highly competitive. And, uh, but generally, yeah. spend a, a lot of time with grandkids. It's a holiday weekend coming up, and a bunch of them are just coming over. In fact, the one of the wonders we have is, as the kids have gotten older and gone off to university, we tend to be their safe haven. They spend more time, more of the holiday time with us and at times with their parents because they come in and it's a no judgment zone. Right. So we're thrilled with that. Right. Grandma and grandpa are kind of, you, you do your thing. <laughs> and then we also have, we've had dogs all our lives and we have uh, two rescues that are, hopefully will stay quiet during this interview. Uh, one guy is a box of pit mix who's, a, who's 10 and the shy little girl is a lab beagle mix who has a howl that will keep away the dead and the vampires. All right. Well, we're dog friendly on, on my cyber. Why dog and cat friendly? So if, if someone needs to howl, that's OK. OK. <laughs> All right. And, and what do you what do you do now? You actually have a, a fairly well, most people would be retired and on the beach. You're, you're still very active in the community. You, you do a lot of public <laughs> Thank you for for sharing your your continuing to share your wisdom, and you you actually have a, a day job too. I love what I do. I, I don't think I will ever retire. I am so fortunate to love what I do. It's been a passion from the time I got started in cybersecurity, uh, from way back when uh, when I was an internal consulting group at the university over at City Corp. I was the first national city bank. And we're really ingenious. We decided we're going to require ID and password modules and COBOL and Fortran code. <laughs> so, it, and it, you're trendsetters. It, it, oh, it was insane because people started hating us from day one we had, when we had to, uh, you know, require them to do IDs and passwords. And then uh, along came the rack Fs and the top secrets of, uh, of the world and uh, the ACF2s. And what people don't realize is one of the benefits of those products was that answering the question we're still trying to answer, can we have an effective single sign-on? And that's what uh, those two, you know, the mainframe products did. But, uh, and I was very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time with the uh, happily at City in this internal consulting group and having a grand time to put together one of the very early SDLC programs and again build security into that and part of and we came up with a wild process for ensuring security and that is we called it a building permit process. And it's a building permit into the SDLC. So just where so you're gonna go build a house, you take a look at what are the uh, what are the zoning requirements and what are the electrical requirements and what are the uh, plumbing requirements and so using the term building requirement became a building permit became something people readily understood. Uh, and then along the way, just where you build a home, you have inspectors come, uh, the assistant quality assurance folks and the 
data security folks became the building inspectors for uh, application development. Yeah. Uh, Code review, building review, you know, architectural yeah. review. Wow, yeah. Okay. So one of the things I learned with that and early on is take the mystery out of security. There's nothing that you should get over the, you know, there shouldn't be a mystery to it why people get rattled by it. Yeah. Having started this and being able to spell the word security, early on Morgan Guarantee reached out. They were setting up a data security department and asked me to come and be part of it. And the, uh, uh, they were a Rack F shop, which is, you know, wonderful IBM product at the time. And the way I really got the job, I was interviewed with the, uh, I guess the head of uh, data center operations, and he said they have Rack F, and I said, gosh, you only have one question for you. I said, the uh, ACF2 and top secret come with a situation where you have to opt in. Uh, so access is denied to everybody. He said, Rack F comes with uh, access allowed to all. How do you set it up? He said, we have a lot of, you know, access allowed to everybody. He said, if you hire me, the first thing I'm going to do is change that, uh, that parameter so that access will be denied to everybody. Yeah. Uh, which we did, and I became a very hated member of Morgan Guarantee because all the access people had suddenly so disappeared. Right. Uh, but it was, you know, while. But their it, attack surface decreased considerably. Uh, we went from the mainframe to we then had these wonderful uh, mid range computers, which then called departmental processes, and then we went from there to PCs and we were happily told that uh, by the CIO that PCs will never be allowed at uh, Morgan Guarantee. And then the guys in the trading room went out and bought PCs and, and uh, early Apple Macs and Apple IIs and just expensed them. Yeah. So it, uh, they learned early on, and so did I early on, that the answer is never no, because any two-year-old can say no. Well, the challenge we had was coming up with an effective way of saying yes, and also recognizing that uh, mystery had to come out. In fact, one of the early things we had done, which uh, stop me when I start chattering too much, but it's a, it's a how, it's a hobby, it's a passion, it's a career. Yeah. Uh, a general came in, filling with Peter Tippett, who uh, started a number of companies, and Peter started one of the very first antivirus products, of uh, virus companies, and he came into my area with a couple of floppy PCs and the guy who wrote the code and floppy disk rather than the guy who wrote the code. Threw it on a couple of our desktops in the area and lo and behold, we had some viruses. Right. So I went to my CIO that I was reporting to and said, uh, Bill, I talked about these PC viruses and he said, Steve, hold off. I'm building my presentation to the board tomorrow. Get to me before the board meeting and we can talk about this. Mm. Uh, so I got to him at 5 to 10 the next morning before the board meeting and told him what was going on. He said, great, take the first five minutes of my board presentation and tell him about this. Oh, wow. <laughs> learned a wonderful lesson. I mean, the, the presentation guys were on my side that day, but we learned a wonderful lesson. And I walked in and the boardroom at J.P. Morgan, Morgan Guarantee was just huge. And they, mm. they brought by a house from the side of what they paid for the conference table. Uh, and I said, you know, so you guys heard about uh, these things called computer viruses and a few of them shook their heads and I said, just take a minute and make me sure we're, we're sitting down in our trading room, down in, you know, downstairs. And fives come, suddenly become eights, threes become zeros, seven become nines. What does that do to our trading positions? And it's, oh my God, can that really happen? I said, oh yeah, absolutely. But not quite at the time, but, and the view was then one of uh, can you stop it? And I said, no, I can't stop it, but can I reduce it? But I can reduce the likelihood of it causing damage. Mm -hmm. And two great lessons came out of that. One, we're solving a business problem. And I could tell a story that, was, that the business leaders can relate to or the board can relate to. And two. You're very popular, Steve, <laughs> clearly by your phone. Yeah, and two, when they said, can you stop it? I said, no, but I can reduce the likelihood. So first thing, I learned the importance of telling a story and putting things in terms of what is the business risk? And that became my mantra going back to the 1980s. Of what is the business risk we're trying to address? And uh, the second is, 
don't make a commitment you can't live up to. I, I don't think there's a security officer around that can stand up and say, don't worry, I've got it, you know, got it covered. We're never going to have a problem. Yeah. We're all going to have a problem. Yeah. And I think the problem security officers have today is that they are, they're significantly concerned that they, like, if we have a breach, we can lose our job. If something goes wrong, we can lose our job. Mm-hmm. Everyone who sits at a trading desk knows that there'll be times when they make bad trades. Everyone who made, every corporate lending officer knows he's going to make a bad loan. Mm-hmm. Uh, guys who, do, who develop pharmaceuticals know that stuff, is gonna, stuff will fail in trials. You don't get fired for that. You get yeah. fired for not playing it straight. Mm-hmm. Uh, so sort of fast, moving fast forward, uh, in the early 90s, there was a rumor that uh, Citigroup, or Citicorp at the time, had been hacked. But no one quite knew what it was all about. I was at Morgan and I got a call to be interviewed for a position over there. And I said, gee, if I go and figure out how City got hacked, I can make sure it doesn't happen at, at Morgan. Right. Uh, the hack, I'm so sorry. The hack. That's what it's like I, to be the world's first CISO. You're constantly being. The hack was really pre internet. And a couple of guys from Russia got into the uh, development data center for the international funds transfer system on a dial in line running into a deck vax environment. Uh, and all they were really looking for at the time was a way to uh, get free dial-ins, global dial in service. And so they come up with a little link that would get them free dial and they could sell it and make a lot of money on it. Once they realized where they were, they did a little exploring and things being what they were at the time, production data was used in the development data center, uh, as were production password files. And uh, came in, they figured out what it was, they dialed, got access to the production data center, and started transferring money all over the world. They uh, actually got away with about $400,000. Uh, $10 million was, went through the wires, and mo- a lot of people coming to pick up the money were actually caught. Oh, okay. So they weren't as sophisticated with their mule kind of yeah. process yet, yeah. But what worked out well for me is as the interview went on and we're getting to so go off me the job, they said it, this was a board uh, issue, and the decision the board made was that they wanted to have an information security executive. Mm-hmm. Uh, would be a C-level executive, equal to C-level executives across the firm. And the title that we came up with was Chief Information Security Officer. Okay. Uh, which was I think, just great. And they said that you have really two things to look at as you, you know, if you accept the job. One, we want you to build the best information security department anywhere in the world. And two, we're going to announce the hack 30 days after you start. Mm. I love my reputation. Uh, and they said, and they said, and your challenge will be to go out and meet with 20 of our top international banking clients and limit the damage. Okay. We want to keep as many of our customers as we can. Mm. So what I did, and I use this a lot, is came up with six very silly, simple questions that I went over, that we used to, just, and I would discuss them with the corporate treasurers and CFOs that was going to go out and meet. And it was, do you care who you're transacting with? Will you know who it is? Do you want to be able to control what they do? Is the privacy and confidentiality, confidentiality of data important? Is the integrity important? Mm-hmm. If it's a transaction, do you want to sign a receipt? Uh, if there's a problem, do you want to know about it? And how soon do you want to know about it? And I went in and almost a little spreadsheet and said, Here's the questions. Here's how City is asking these questions today. And here's what, how we're going to be asking these questions in six months. As in, I sort of like to ask you to do two things. One, see how you are asking these questions in your own company, because I think it's important because your company has to provide security and privacy yeah. and trust. And two, go out to your other bank, because we know you're using other banks, and see how they are answering them. And Within the next month, was they got back to me because they gave all of them my home number, my office number. At that time, I paid your number. I said, have any questions, call me. 
And when the next month they got back and said, none of the other banks would tell them how they were addressing these things because it was security. Two lessons. One, they were very simple, understandable terms that business leaders could understand and relate to. And two, there was transparency. I said, you have to go, those other banks need to tell you what they're doing. We didn't lose a customer. Yeah. Because simple, understandable explanation takes the complexity out of security because it didn't have to be there. And play it very straight. And Isn't it amazing what happens when you're honest? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And what what yeah. you need to do is if you are information security, I'm going to go back to my presentations at Morgan Guarantee, which is the yeah. is a business risk management issue. If you're not solving a real business problem, then there's no need to be there. Yeah. If you're not enabling a business, there's no need to be there. If you're not enabling a program, there's no need to be there. Uh, you are there to help a company grow. You are, you are not a cost center, you're an investment center that enables new products and services to be delivered in a secure fashion. You enable and facilitate a merge or an acquisition. You are able to facilitate a divestiture when that happens. But you're dealing with business issues. You're dealing with something that's important to the business and it is something that's bigger than just security. And that's, I think, just incredibly important. It is. You, know, you said something really interesting. Well, you said a lot of very interesting things. But, but one thing stuck out, which is that when you were given the job as CISO at Citi, they designed it for you to be a member of the board. And one of the big challenges now, and that was- Reporting into. Reporting into, okay, sorry, yeah, I'm, I apologize. Reporting into the world, but a C-suite level mm -hmm. job. And this was what, 1990, right. 1995. And here we are almost 25 years later. And one of the big challenges that continues to be a problem in the CISO community is, quote, getting a seat at the table, being able to get to the C-suite. And it's, it's fascinating that the very first time this was a job, it was designed as a C-suite role. What do you think has happened in the interim that has created more of a, because a lot of the CISOs out in the world are really more of a director, senior director, obviously it depends on which company they are, but but you know, not quite at C level, despite having C in their title. Part of it is, how do you see yourself? Oh. Another part, of, you know, too many of uh, for many of our CISOs, and I, I mentor new CISOs. Uh, yeah. CISO been in the job for a while, and CISO wannabes. And so, the question I ask is, why do you want to be a CISO? Mm -hmm. And if it's not a passion, if it's not something that excites you, don't do it. If your only reason for doing this, you can get paid a lot more. Guaranteed you're going to have a lot more stress and you're going to have a fairly short duration in that job. Yeah. It's got to be something you want to do. The other is, and one of the questions I ask guys who are, and a lot of them are, really solidly and impressive information security technology guys. And I tell them that you have the best safety net in the world. You're a technological expert. You can be a technological expert where you are now, and if things don't go right, you can get another job two days from now, probably making more, more than you're making today. If you decide you want to move into this CISO role, understand you're going to go from being a technological expert to being technologically proficient to being technologically knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. You may never climb that mountain again. Yeah. Uh, the other is you're going to have to develop a set of skills that you may have, but you've never really polished. And that is you are running a company within a company. You're running the information security organization within your company. And you, have to, you are working with the C-suite executives. They become your board of directors. They are the ones you're going to go to for funding. And you have to be able to communicate with them, understand what they do, and understand why they do what they do. When I talk to, you know, CISO wannabes or current CISOs. Uh, and so I asked some very simple questions and at time to get absolutely shocked by not getting an answer. Mm. One of the first is, why does your company have a security program? Why should it? Yeah. 
that you would expect to be a ready answer. Sure. And half the time there isn't. The other is how does your company generate revenue and earnings? You figure they should know that. Yeah. What are the products and services your company offers? Yeah. Who are the leaders of those products and services? So who are the leaders of those lines of business? Because if you don't know who they are, why should they want to know who you are? Mm-hmm. You are there to facilitate what they're doing. They're not there to facilitate security. Mm-hmm. And you're there to help them figure out how, uh, uh, the least risky path to yes. Mm-hmm. And if the goal is to just stop things from happening, you're not going to be there for a long time. Or to just have a title. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Yeah. Title is short lived. So, what is your passion? You know, you talk about needing to have a passion. What is it when you were at Morgan and you were at City? They're protecting the assets. Is, is that the why? 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 why yeah, it, it was a term. They tell they tell the story. It's every legend. I have no idea whether it's true or not. That when John Kennedy announced the space program, uh, year or two after he announced it, he was going on a tour of, uh, of the Jet Propulsion Lab. And as he's walking through towards the end of the day, he came across one of the folks who was one of the custodians there. That's kind of obvious what the guy did, but Kennedy went over to him and said, he introduced himself and said, what is it you do here at JPL? Mm-hmm. And the guy looked up and said, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. Mm-hmm. His job was helping to put a man on the moon. My job, whether it was at Morgan or City, was to provide, to ensure the city, that both companies were able to meet the trust commitments they had to their customers. Mm-hmm. And the challenge was finding a way to consistently do that as technology was going to change, as regulations are going to change, as legal requirements are going to change, and as product offerings are going to change. And it, it was a role where you could, you have to constantly remain current. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no way in creation you can allow yourself to get stale. Yeah. Uh, and you meet some of the nicest, greatest, smartest people in the world. Uh, some of the security community is one of consistently paying it forward. They've yeah. been that way since the mid 80s. Uh, I used to meet with the data security officers of the New York City banks every three months, doing nothing more than having muffins, bagels, and coffee and saying, what are the issues we're facing and how can we work better together? And when somebody was new into the, into the area and one of us got a phone call saying, uh, gee, I, they just gave me this job of data security officer, what am I supposed to do? Any one of us would just be there saying, let's spend some time together and let's you know, help each other out. And that's consistent throughout the community. And that's probably the best part about it is consistently paying things forward. That's great. So yeah, the, the, the mission of what got you excited is, is protecting, keeping the business running, protecting the data, protecting assets so people can have the money they expect in their account. And then what keeps you going is the network and the community, because it is true. We're a very supportive community of each other, mm-hmm. especially in the beginning, because there were so few of us that were even practicing. It was like we were kind of Martians from another. I used to tell people what I do for a living and, and you know, back in the, the early 90s, and they'd be like, that's not a job. Now people know what we do. <laughs> yeah, trying to explain what I did way back when was uh, yeah. interesting because I would try to explain it early on. And yeah, we had three heads. <laughs> it, it looked at me and said, look, I really can't t- talk much about it because government clearances are required. And I won't put an end to it. Oh, <laughs> the, the, the classic, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> okay. so, it, it's just a load of fun, though. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's, it's been, and thank you so much for everything you've done for the, the field. If you uh, could talk, you know, and you have a chance now you, to, talk, what, to talk to people in the field and cybersecurity and certainly the, the current and the aspiring CISOs, what would you say to them? What would you, what's your call to action for our community today in, in 2019? First of all, make sure it's a passion, something you really want to do. Second of all, don't ever really confuse what you do with what you are. Uh, There was an article that came out a few months back that talked about very high stress levels experienced by CISOs and significant numbers of them turning to alcohol or drugs as stress relievers. Uh, You will never come to the end of the day 
as a CISO where you have uh, done everything you wanted to do that day. It's never going to happen. Yeah. You got to put some boundaries around what you're doing. I traveled extensively when I was at City and at, at Morgan. Yeah. And I have multi millions of miles on different airlines. Uh, when I was home, when I was in the States, uh, I was in the office generally about 6.30 every morning. Mm -hmm. I left religiously at 5. I had dinner with the family and then it's work that had to be done. It would be done while the kids were doing homework and dinner was finished. Uh, and the, the other is, and this, I take this pretty seriously, everyone on every job runs the risk of getting fired. Nature yeah. of you know, working yeah. with a company at will. If, you ever, if you're going to run the risk of getting fired as a CISO, get fired for doing the right thing, not for what you think is the politically correct thing to do. Yeah. Uh, there was one situation the gentleman I was working for, one of the banks who was about to bring a new product out and that whole marketing campaign around it and everything else. And uh, he called me about 30 days before they're going to go live with a public announcement. And I looked at it and said, can't move. This is, I said, you're going to put the entire institution at risk. And he said, you can't stop me. And I said, I can. He said, I'm going to get you fired. I said, go ahead. I said, but I'm going to go. I said, if you can stop, you know, you and I can agree that you're going to hold it until we get things corrected. Or I will, you know, take it to the uh, head of the audit committee on the board, but you just can't go forward with the way this is. And if you want to blow me out of here, okay. Yeah. I didn't yeah. get enough, but uh, if I said, well, yeah, sure, let's go ahead. We can make an exception. We'll move forward. I would have put certainly the company at risk, but it was, and I would have deserved to be fired for not doing my job. Yeah, that, that is, yeah, it's true. It's, it's a, a higher calling at some sense. You're, it, it's, it's not just about fitting in politically. Sometimes the, the, the security officers have, we have to say things that are going to not be popular with some of the business unit owners. Wait. My tagline, I've said this at the speaking engagement, so probably people who see this have heard it before, but uh, when I was a city for a few months and the hack became public and someone said, what's it like to be the CISO at City? And I said, I sleep like a baby. I get up every two hours and cry. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's okay, you know, you can cry every two hours. It's all right. That's right. You still have a, a, a great life and, and held on to who you are, even despite all that stress. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, really, Steve. It's, it's always it's such a, a pleasure and an honor to speak with you. And again, thank you for what you've done for, for the community and, and creating the role of CISO and, and all that it is. Really appreciate your, your time today. Thank you, Diane. It's my pleasure. Good thank talk you. to you. And thanks everybody for tuning in. We will see you next month on My Cyber Why.